Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou School Boys Varsity Tennis Team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my new book, Superior, and it's about mastering your mindset and creating a superior culture of excellence. My special guest today is our former attorney general and current U.S. attorney for our state of Hawaii. She is Claire Connors, and today we are going beyond law enforcement. Hey, Claire, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Thank you, Rusty. It's wonderful to be able to engage with you today. Claire, you are such an incredible person, and I'm just thinking, where did you get all these amazing qualities from? It's probably your mom. And can you tell me about your mom helping to volunteer at the Women's Correctional Center and, and the impact that she's making? Yes, my mom is a doer. She is somebody who has always demonstrated how we do things and done it by example. And the work that she's done with the prison, uh, the Women's Correctional Facility out in Kailua is a perfect example of that. She's been doing that program for a couple of decades now as part of the uh, Lani Kailua Outdoor Circle, where she's been a volunteer and a president and all types of leadership positions. And it's a wonderful opportunity to help women who are in a position of needing to find how, how to get back into society and to do it productively and constructively. And what my mom and her team do is they go and they teach them how to grow hydroponic lettuce, how to watch and be a part of something growing and being nurtured, and then selling it at uh, different local places in Kailua. So it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, program that she's a part of, and it's a wonderful thing to watch. Someone in her early 80s out there a couple times a week working on this really very important project. Well, she's an inspiration for sure, and, and so are you, Claire. And I want to share with everyone that you had graduated from Punahou School, and then you graduated, graduated from Yale University, and then you started working at, in New York City for the Department of Parks and Recreation. Can you tell me what your role was with the Parks and Recreation, and um, what was your experience like? Sure. Uh, it was the first job I had out of college, and it was a very unique opportunity to become a part of government. Uh, when we talk about government, there's usually three different levels, city, state, and federal. And at the city level, you are very close to the people you serve. In government, you're serving people. You have a mission that's very people-oriented. And when you're working for the city, especially in the parks department, you're making sure beaches are open, pools are safe, and the things that matter very dearly to people who live in a community are handled effectively. And for three years, I got to be a part of an amazing team where that's exactly what we were doing in the parks. We were looking at how we were developing capital projects. We were looking at where we were putting resources on maintenance. We were engaging with the community. And it got me thinking, this is what community is supposed to look like. We're supposed to have effective government and people who are part of a larger mission involved in it. And that was the true opportunity that I had working in New York City that then led on to other decisions that I made in life and moving forward. Yeah, that's a, that's a great experience, especially in New York City and seeing how that whole system works. And, and then you went uh, to Harvard Law School. You graduated from Harvard Law. I mean, super impressive, Claire. And then how, how did your legal career begin? Well, I'd say it began in New York City. The reason I went to law school and the decision to go to law school is as much a part of the story as what we actually did in law school. And I wanted to know how this democracy that I was a part of, that I was working on behalf of, really worked. How we frame things legally so that we can get to a place where people are resolving disputes and and actively living in peace with each other. So that was the decision to go to law school. And when I was in law school, we uh, focused a lot on those very important tenets, right? How we are a part of ensuring that people are safe, secure, and have peaceful ways of resolving things. And that's in part what led me to the Department of Justice after um, graduating from law school. And so what did, can you fill me in about uh, working with Judge David Ezra? Yes, that was my first legal job before I joined the Department of Justice. And I had done a summer 
out here in the U.S. Attorney's Office, which was a remarkable opportunity to be a part of this office that I now lead. And during that summer, I had the opportunity to be in court and to witness how the third branch of government engaged with the first, uh, second branch of government, our executive U.S. Attorney's Office, and at that point decided it would be a very neat thing to uh, do a clerkship and apply to uh, be one of Judge Ezra's law clerks. And it was indeed a remarkable experience, really got me familiar with how justice works, how the courts work, how people bring their disputes into the court and resolve them peasefully. Wow. Well, I have to say now, uh, if we move forward after that, in 2015, President Obama nominated you as U.S. District Judge. And can you tell me about how you felt being nominated and tell me about the role that you played being a district judge? Yeah, so that was a really interesting opportunity. It was something that I applied to. I hadn't thought about being a judge. I didn't grow up thinking I'm going to be a judge. But when I started talking with people, actually opposing counsel were the first folks who suggested it might be a good idea for me to think about. I then went through the process and uh, put my name in there, said yes to the opportunity. And then when the president said nomination was pending, would I do it? I was in a position to say yes and and to take that honor, which was which was remarkable. Uh, then politics got involved, and the uh, death of Justice Scalia meant that I didn't get the full Senate vote, but that was okay because I got out of committee and I had put myself out there, and it was a, a very wonderful honor and a truly impactful experience to go through. So, Claire, what what would you say? is the best part of being a judge? And what would you say is the most challenging part of being a judge? Yes, uh, at this point, I just still get to appear in front of judges since that possibility went by the wayside. But what judges have to do is very difficult. Uh, they are the ones who have to ensure order in the court. They have to ensure that people are treated fairly. They have to ensure that their court is run in a way where people feel like there is going to be justice served at the end of the day. So when we bring, as U.S. Attorney's Office and the assistants that I work with, our matters to the court system and to the, the third branch of government, we need to be sure that uh, the judges who are there and that we um, uh, have before us are ones who are listening to us and that we're listening to them, too. They um, are going to tell us what they need, and it's a very much of a give-and-take process in the court system. Wow. <laughs> and Claire, in 2019, Governor David Ige nominated you, uh, actually just appointed you as uh, attorney general. Can you tell me how that felt? And then if you can explain uh, what role you were in as attorney general that you were overseeing. Yes. Well, that was another example of being in a position to say yes when an opportunity came knocking. And it wasn't something I'd thought about. I'd never worked in state government before. I'd certainly appeared in state court and and was, like so many of us in Hawaii, interested in matters happening at the state legislature and at the state level. But when I got asked to put my name into that process, I at first said, why would I do that? I'm pretty happy now with the life I lead. And someone said, well, if you don't do it, who will? And that that was an important thing for me to hear. I did that, ended up going through the process again. There is a process for being nominated and being selected. And then uh, with his nomination and the confirmation of the Hawaii Senate, had the honor of serving as attorney general for three years. Very large department it is, 600 different uh, employees with a lot of mandates that the legislature places on us of uh, 27 different departments, I think, at a given time. So it's uh, where everything happens at the state level, right? General jurisdiction. Uh, and in that time, I had the opportunity to argue in front of the Hawaii Supreme Court, which was an honor to work on a lot of very important initiatives that affect so many people in so many different ways in our state. So most of us have never, we have no idea about what it's like to be attorney general and the demands that you have. Can you share a little bit more about how demanding that schedule is and then just like what you were doing to really make a positive impact in Hawaii? Sure. Well, as the attorney for the state, you are the one who provides legal advice to the governor, 
to all of the legislators on, in the first branch of government. And then you're also the one who advocates or leads the advocacy on behalf of the state in the court system and in various different lawsuits and endeavors. So you have clients all, you have hundreds and hundreds of clients really, right? When you count the legislature, when you count your uh, agencies who rely on you. So it is a seven day a week, sometimes 24 hour a day job. And it's something where your phone is always ringing because somebody, when you've earned that trust, is always going to be saying, Claire, I'd like your thoughts on this. Or can you help me out with this issue? Or we have this coming down the pike. I think it would be good to get the legal framework clear before we start making some decisions. And that was with our political friends in the first branch, and it was also with our executive friends in the second branch, and then, of course, with our um, in our courts. So uh, I had to be the leader of a department of 600 people, as I said, which uh, comes with a lot of challenges, but a lot of opportunities because people go into government to become a part of an institution, to become part of a mission that's not for money, it's for really doing good. And you wanna be able to capitalize on that by example, I would like to go in and argue cases because I wanted to show the attorneys, and there are about 240 of them, that this is what I think is the way an argument should be done or the way we address the court and move forward in that regard. Wow, no, interesting insights there, Claire. And can you, um, one of the departments that you oversaw as attorney general was the Missing Child Center of Hawaii. And Amanda Leonard has had been on my show very recently and she's such an, uh, wow, I mean, effective leader. I mean, she's making such a big positive impact. And mm -hmm. she speaks so highly of you, Claire. And can you um, share about why she's such a, a great leader? She's a great leader because she is leading one of the most difficult but important parts of the Attorney General's office. There is no greater cause to protect than that of our children, right? And making sure that our children are safe. And that is not something that any one person can do. It takes coordination. It takes collaboration. It takes putting egos aside. We all come at this conversation from the state level, from the city level, from the federal level, from law enforcement, from victim-centered uh, perspectives. And somebody has to pull that all together at the end of the day to make sure what we're doing first and foremost, is protecting the children. And that's what the Missing Child Center of Hawaii does. Uh, and Amanda is a wonderful leader in that regard because she's able to communicate with everybody. She is in the room at all times. So people know they can trust her. They also know that she's not an ego in there trying to just create a next stat. She's actually committed to finding the children who might be runaways, uh, might be trafficked, might be any number of a different type of scenarios. And she's great because she helps everybody use the resources that they bring to the table effectively. So at the end of the day, we're making sure we are finding our missing children. Yeah, that's definitely her passion and, and her purpose. I mean, wow. I mean, it just the impact that she's making is ginormous. And I have mm -hmm. to share with everybody, Claire, in 2021, President Biden nominated you as U.S. Attorney for Hawaii. Can you explain the role uh, of U.S. Attorney now that you're currently in? Yes. So I was very happy being the Attorney General for the state of Hawaii. We really had a lot going on. It was very mission oriented. And then I did get asked to do this. And it is different. Although I was the chief law enforcement officer and chief legal officer at the state side, what I was being asked to do was to become the chief legal uh, law enforcement officer on the federal side. So that's currently what I do here in the District of Hawaii. There are 93 U.S. attorneys as opposed to 56 attorney generals, and our mandate is smaller. So when you talk about government, the federal government specific, we do only what Congress says we can do. State does everything, right? General jurisdiction. So here now what our mandate is, is to protect the community from threats that are foreign and domestic. And a lot of our foreign threats nobody ever hears about, right? We're working on that in, in quarters that are secure. Our mandate is also to protect civil rights. That was actually how the Department of Justice was founded uh, in the 1870s to protect the rights of newly freed slaves. And what the Department of Justice did was to prosecute members of the Ku Klux Klan that was preventing people from voting, becoming a part of our civic process. And that's our mandate still, is to protect civil rights. And then the third thing we do is we uphold the rule of law. And that means we do that by working productively within our court system, as we talked about before, being good advocates in the court system, working with the, the judges and, and such. But also it means that we are out there doing law enforcement activities and making sure that there is accountability. 
Calais, who was previously on your story, uh, on your show, had a story about how it was law enforcement that finally made the space available to her to get out of her situation. And that's our mandate, and that's what we do here in the District of Hawaii. Yeah, and if we can just talk a little further about how you brought up Calais Grant and I, how I had her on my show, really highlighting that she's a sex trafficking survivor and um, her incredible story and her impact that she's making. Could, could you expand on that? Yes. So it's along the lines of what you have said in, in your book, right? Uh, the mindset, when we have something happen to us, and that does happen in life, we get to control the response. But it's not always so easy, right? It's not, oh, I can brush this off, or yes, I can move on. It can be something as devastating as what Calais went through. And what she had to do is she had to change her mindset. She had to figure out how to get to a new place so that she could start that process of healing. We in law enforcement want to create that space. We want to be the ones who can ensure that what we do is victim-centered and trauma-informed so that someone like Calais has the opportunity and the space to make those kinds of decisions. And that's really what Calais is a beautiful example of, is it doesn't matter how terrible things get for you. You always do have the ability to have the mindset that will get you to a better place. And it's not easy. In her case, it was step-by-step step. for a lot of us. It's not just one decision, it's many decisions, but it's that first step and that first decision and it comes from the mindset that you choose to have. And Claire, all of us, we all love and appreciate Crime Stoppers coordinator, Sergeant Chris Kim. And can you share about the impact that he's making with his entire Crime Stoppers organization? He's a wonderful example of a leader of an institution that is so important to what we do here in law enforcement. The ability for the community to participate in keeping us protected and safe is key to having a wherewithal or a sense that we do matter as members of a community, that we have a role to play, that these things aren't just happening to us, but we can pick up the phone and we can give a lead or a tip, and that actually matters. And what Chris does is he puts a face to that whole process. He makes it personable. You are aware of who it is you're calling and the institution, the people he works with being folks who are gonna pick up that phone. So it makes it worth your while to do that. We need folks in law enforcement who personalize it, who give people the avenues and literally the phone line to call in and to help. And that's what he does and he does it really well. I completely agree with you, Claire. And and Claire, you mentioned my book earlier, I, and you have all three of my books, including my new third book, Superior. And when I when I write when I when I wrote Superior, I'm thinking, this is the epitome of what, what you are because you are a superior achiever. And and I we've all heard of the term high achievers, and I invented the term superior achievers in there. And I look at somebody like you, you are definitely a superior achiever, and I'm trying to share the differences between good, great, and superior. Uh, what are some things that stood out to you in the books? Well, as I talked about the, the positive impact, the mindset, right, that we get to choose, that's critically important. You get to make a decision about how you're going to respond in every moment, whether it's a split-second decision on the arena and the court, uh, the tennis court, like you talk about, or in Calais situation, or if I'm testifying in front of Congress or whatever it might be, I choose what I say and how I do it. And you need to evaluate. It might go well sometime. It might need to be something you do differently the next time. But what's great about your book, Superior in particular, is that it's a good one for people who are students of leadership. In my mind, leaders are students of leadership. They are ones who never think the journey of learning is over. They are always going to be reading. They're always going to be observing. They're going to be listening. They're going to be writing down the quotes that they need to go to, as you suggest in your book, so that they have their own catalog to draw on when they hit snags or when they need guidance. You build up your own toolbox. You can't rely on other people to do that. And I think that's what I found to be really remarkable. Your book belongs on the reading list of anyone who is a student and a true leader. Wow. Oh, thank you. I, oh, what a compliment from you, Claire. That's awesome. <laughs> and um, well, obviously, you know, through your career, you've been around many incredible, great and superior leaders and you're one yourself. What, what would you say are some of the characteristics of great or even superior leaders? 
there are people who know how to make decisions and they might not know how to make decisions right at the outset of their journey as a leader, but they are people who really think about the impact that decisions have. I think that when you look at the different things you cover in your book, it's all a series of decisions, right? We decide success based on decisions about strategy or tactics. We decide on resiliency based on decisions about modifying our course of conduct or how we're gonna strategize better. When you talk about the legacy or the example you're gonna leave, it's all about the decisions you've made and including the people you've chosen to walk that journey with. So when we think about decisions, that I think is the critical part. And it's also the part that we can look at as students of leadership, something we can do better at, right? So we can always try to become better at making decisions. But when you're at a place of leadership, when you're making decisions about personnel issues or making decisions about policy or how we're going to move forward a mission, being able to say, this is why, and this is how, these are all parts of the decision-making process. So I do think that when you look back at what some of the key fundamental things are and takeaways are, it's about how we decide what we're going to do and why we're going to do it. I love how you explain things so clearly. <laughs> and Claire, you know in the book I'm trying to shift the narrative from mental health to mental fitness because Sometimes when we hear the words mental health, it's it's almost like, oh, something's wrong with you. But all of us, we all need to improve our mental fitness. And for me as an executive coach, I'm trying to help executives and their teams with their physical fitness so they can have peak performance at work and at home, as well as their mental fitness so they can have peak performance at work and at home. What are your thoughts about trying to shift the narrative to mental fitness? Well, when you shift the narrative to mental mental fitness, you make it again about you. You make it something that you can control. And again, as a leader, you can't control what all the folks in your team or on your team or in your department are going to do, but you can certainly control how they respond and how you respond and what that culture looks like. So when you talk about fitness, you're talking about a regime, you're talking about a set of codes, a set of conducts that we appreciate and that we understand and that we apply. And that starts, as we said, here in your head, in your mindset. And it also then starts in what you're projecting as a set of examples that you want others in your organization to follow or to take some kind of um, wisdom from or some kind of example from. So I do think that the idea behind mental fitness incorporates all the different things that we think about when we talk about being ready, when we talk about being resilient, and when we talk about what it takes to make sure that we're accomplishing, at least in government, the mission that is upon us. Well, Claire, I'm sure people that are watching this show that are team members, part of a team that will be inspired by listening and watching you as an as incredible superior leader. Um, I want to ask you about teamwork right now because the greatest leaders build other great leaders. And that's what you do as well. And some people that are, you know, on, on a team, team members, they might be aspiring uh, leaders. Uh, what are your thoughts on what they should do or how they should go about really preparing themselves for when they might have a possible opportunity? Sure. So I think there's there's two things, right? Again, think about your decision-making process. Think about how it is you make decisions. I, for one, I look inside and I look outside. I look inside and do a gut check when it comes to a decision. And I look outside, I call it my board of directors, to people who aren't going to tell me what they think I want to hear, but who are going to tell me what they know I need to hear. So that decision-making process, think about that, become a student of it, make sure that you're constantly evolving in it. And then say yes. Say yes to the big opportunities. Say yes to the small opportunities. Say yes when you're asked to sit on a committee and say yes when you're asked to serve as the attorney general. But the small decisions and the big decisions all require the same process. It's just as you build that idea of, yes, I can do this. Yes, I think I can do it. It usually starts small, but then all of a sudden you're saying yes to the president of the United States of America. And that's that's doesn't just happen. That's a, a process. And, it, and I think it comes down to being able to make decisions. <laughs> I love that insight right there. <laughs> and Claire, uh, as U.S. attorney, what, what would you say is the toughest, biggest challenge that you deal with in your role right now? So keeping the folks here in Hawaii safe, 
is the biggest challenge. When I look at the priorities that we've set in this department, and I've had a, a lot of time to think through them, having been on the line in this office and now having come to, to be the U.S. Attorney in this office, and what we need to do is set the priorities that best reflect the needs of this district. And one of the biggest things that the federal government here, and particularly the law enforcement community here, can do is to ensure public integrity, right? We have the ability through the different investigative resources that are at our disposal to go to places that our state and local folks can't go when it comes to looking at integrity crimes. So that is a very big thing. We all need to have faith in government and we need good government and the ability for government to hold itself and our counterparts accountable is critical to good functioning government and government that people believe in. So that's one of our biggest mandates. We are always going to be looking out for children. We are always going to be working on our Project Safe Childhood, working with Amanda, working with the state and local task forces. We also have a very significant mandate when it comes to our national security. And because I'm a part of the federal government and the office that we're a part of here is very involved in what's happening in the geopolitical theater across the world, we have to focus on those national security threats. But at the end of the day, those big things reduce to what we do in court, what the public sees of us, and the public needs to know what we're doing and how we're doing it to the extent that we can talk about that. And that doesn't come easy for people in government. We're not used to talking to the public, but we do need to be able to engage with the public so that they know what it is we are doing and that when we are moving forward agendas, we're doing it because we have a mission that's reflective of the needs of the community and we're doing our best to get to that, that end point. Claire, um, what would you say um, it might be a future goal of yours in terms, maybe personally, but maybe for the for the state of Hawaii, because you've been helping Hawaii for so many years now. What, what would you like to see done in Hawaii? And I mean, how can we improve it even more? I do think that as we look at the different branches of government that we've talked about, the first, second, and third, and I always call the media the fourth branch of democracy, we need to think about how we talk to each other. And we need to think about how we resolve disputes, right? That's, as I said, coming full circle, what got me into the law, what I learned when I was working with the city in New York, is that we're always going to have areas of disagreement. It's a question of how we resolve them and what fora we create. Social media, I think, has created a significant challenge, not just for those of us in law enforcement, but for those of us who live in a community like Hawaii. How we resolve really important issues has to come down to the process that we set up. And I think that's an area that we all need to take a hard look at, how we talk to each other, how we resolve things, the respect we have for our institutions, but also how our institutions might need to change to embrace a new way of engaging with each other so that we can do it peacefully and we can do it in a way that moves us forward and where at the end of the day we have accountability and justice. Claire, I want to ask you one more thing before we wrap up. What gives you fulfillment? What gives me fulfillment is the people that I am around when it comes to the work that I do, when it comes to the family things that we do. The, this weekend I was at the I Love Kailua Town Party working with a bunch of volunteers, creating a wonderful event for the community. What gives me fulfillment is the people, or are, I should say, the people who are around me. Uh, and those are the decisions that you get to make. You don't get to choose your family, but you certainly get to choose how you engage with your family and how you bring more people into your family, into your friend sphere, and into your work sphere. So. To me, it's being able to work with a good team on the collegiate level and to be able to work with a wonderful community um, and with community members to make sure that our community is what we all want it to be. Well, Claire, I have to say that I want more Claire's in the world, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I, I the world needs more Claire's, and I can see you, Claire, becoming governor. I can see you becoming president. I mean... I want more Claire's in the world, and I, I want to really thank you for taking time to join me on the show today. Well, thank you, Rusty. This is a great conversation that you have with so many people in our community. I learn a lot, and I think it goes a long way to making sure we know what we're all doing and how we can all do it better. So thank you. Thanks, Claire. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com. And my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope that Claire and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.
Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.